Only a few months after their first intense battle, Mike Tyson and Donovan Razor Ruddick were ready to go at it again. Both men, along with many in the general public, felt that the first fight had been stopped prematurely. And so, the two warriors would face off one more time to see who would have the opportunity to challenge Evander Holyfield for heavyweight championship of the world. The first fight had been a fascinating clash of styles. Ruddick had managed to negate much of Tyson's aggressive counterpunching with clinch work, and he'd landed a number of well-timed counters when Iron Mike tried to jab his way in. What's more, Ruddick's stellar jab and long guard had shut down much of Tyson's angular, multi-stance footwork and side-to-side -side head movement. Likewise, Tyson had been able to shut down Ruddick's best technique, the smash. The punch that Ruddick had nicknamed the smash was a hybrid between a hook and an uppercut. Ruddick loaded this terrifying blow by leaning back and dropping his hand nearly to the floor. But Tyson had expertly countered Ruddick's smash with a hard overhand. But Ruddick was also no slouch when it came to the sweet science. He had in turn countered Tyson's overhand with the sharp left hook uppercut combination that very same round, hurting him badly. However, the next round, Tyson found a way through, and it was Ruddick who had handed him the keys to the door. Having trained his entire life in the peekaboo style of boxing, Tyson was tailor-made to counter power shots and punish the smallest mistakes. Ruddick had led with his right hand, and that was all Tyson needed. He slipped and countered with the right body hook, lead head hook combination. Ruddick stumbled back, and Tyson went for the finish, battering him with four wild, unanswered punches. The ref had ended the bout, and a real fight had erupted in the ring. So now, it was time to get a definitive answer on who deserved a shot at the title. Both men charged forward to center ring, but it was Ruddick who blinked first hastily retreating from Tyson's slick counter jab, then circling away from his wild right body blow. Ruddick wisely made use of the entire ring, circling and stiff-arming Tyson to keep him at range and stifle his head movement. Even so, it wasn't long until things heated up. Ruddick slipped outside Tyson's jab to load up a hard lead uppercut, but Tyson took the shot well and immediately countered with a tremendous overhand but Ruddick managed to take away some of the impact by moving with the punch. Tyson immediately went back on the attack, but Ruddick stood his ground. And this one exchange would set the tone for the rest of the fight, both men willing to stand at range and prove who was the better puncher. Throughout the round, Ruddick's lead uppercut continuously frustrated Tyson's head movement. Ruddick caught Tyson as he attempted to slip to his favorite inside head slot, effectively stopping him from loading his lead hook. If this was Team Razor's game plan for the fight, it was working spectacularly. But then, 20 seconds left in the round, Tyson took yet another lead uppercut. But this time, he went with it, laterally shuffling to regain his balance and following with another hard overhand. Ruddick was shaken and had to clinch and shell up for the remainder of the round. But it wasn't over yet. The two exchanged blows after the bell. After all, these men talked with their fists, and neither was willing to let the other have the last word. Ruddick's strategy to track Tyson's head movement with lead uppercuts cost him yet again at the start of the second. But he did have success using his lead to frame and keep the distance. What's more, by freezing Tyson's head movement, Ruddick had time to slip in tight hooks and uppercuts, but Tyson was too relentless for Ruddick to keep him at bay indefinitely. His game plan seemed to be to tie Tyson up when he got close, but once again, Tyson had an answer, targeting Ruddick's midsection with hard, punishing hooks. But this tactic actually resulted in a warning for throwing low blows. When the action resumed, Tyson almost casually sent Ruddick to the canvas. Ruddick had failed to elevate his lead shoulder while leverage blocking, a crucial detail that can leave a fighter incredibly vulnerable if overlooked. All the same, Ruddick was up right away. Tyson charged forward, landing several rights in succession. But despite drilling in his signature rear hook to uppercut combination, Ruddick remained conscious and willing to engage. He managed to keep Tyson at arm's length the remainder of the round. It seemed that for Ruddick, his long guard would be a double-edged sword.
and this would hold true for the third as well, where Ruddock set up several hard rights off of his lead hand frames. He would even transition to a collar tie to pull Tyson into uppercuts. Ruddock's uppercuts continued to deter Tyson's low-line head movement. These weren't smashes, but regular short uppercuts, much more suited to the task at hand. And Tyson seemed unable to replicate the overhand counter that had negated this punch so well before. By the end of the third, the momentum seemed to have shifted entirely. But then, Ruddock abandoned his short, tight shot set up off of frames and decided to risk throwing his signature punch. Tyson easily slipped Ruddock's smash and moved into close range. Ruddock followed up with an even wilder right uppercut. Tyson's response resulted in one of the strangest, but most epic knockdowns of all time. Tyson shifted back to evade Ruddock's haymaker, then put the momentum from his step back into a thunderous jab off of his new lead hand. Ruddock was now down for the second time in only four rounds. But once again, he was up within seconds. A repeat of the second ensued, with Ruddock remaining upright but taking several hard shots, one of which sent his mouthpiece flying. Now visibly frustrated, Tyson once again threw after the bell, and this time, the ref decided to deduct one point. This actually erased Tyson's knockdown from the scorecards, but not the toll it had taken on Ruddock. While both men now had a good reason to get aggressive, Tyson to finish the fight, and Ruddock to get momentum back, they each seemed content to pick their moments during the fifth. Tyson looked to throw one-off power blows with the occasional head-body combo mixed in. He showcased few of the long combinations and innovative head movement with angular footwork he was capable of. So by the sixth, Ruddock's small, concise shots were landing more and more consistently. Until Tyson finally seemed to come awake, unloading a barrage of long combinations on Ruddock's chin. But then, with only 10 seconds remaining, Ruddock finally managed to time his smash, catching Tyson as he ducked inside. Now it was Tyson's mouthpiece that went flying. However, he managed to remain upright and finish the round. Ruddock managed to build on his momentum in the seventh. Going back to what was probably his coach's game plan, Ruddock again used frames to stifle Tyson's head movement and keep him in place for follow-up shots. By the end of the round, Ruddock was nearly landing at will. The announcers speculated it may be a 10-8 round for Ruddock, even without any knockdowns. And Ruddock pulled off this same feat in the eighth, unloading shot after shot. Tyson threw one last punch right at the bell, prompting an enraged Ruddock to throw one last shot at Tyson that was clearly after the bell. So now, it was Ruddock's turn for the ref to take a point away. Luckily for the crowd, both men showed renewed urgency in the ninth, each taking major risks. Sometimes these risks paid off, and sometimes, they proved costly. Tyson was deducted yet another point for a low blow. And then, the slugfest continued uninterrupted until the bell sounded the end of the round. In Tyson's corner, his coach suggested he set up right body hooks off of his jab. This turned out to be excellent advice. For the 10th, each time Ruddock attempted to clinch or shell up in a high guard, Tyson pounded solid shots into his ribs. The human body can only take so much punishment. Eventually, Ruddock attempted to block Tyson's crushing body blows, but this opened up his guard for more varied shots to get through. However, yet again, this resulted in a low blow point deduction for Tyson. Tyson seemed not to mind and continued his barrage. But eventually, Tyson committed to a hard jab with no setup or head movement. And this allowed Ruddock to connect with a thunderous check hook. Now it was his turn to pile on the pressure. At that moment, Tyson seemed to remember he was capable of some of the best head movement in the world, dodging six fight-ending punches in a row. 
Ruddock reset and landed a crisp leading cross. Tyson fired back, but missed, and the two fought like madmen until the round came to a close. Tyson did not seem eager to make adjustments. He landed a borderline low blow that received a warning. And then, Ruddock countered back with a vengeance, landing a low blow of his own. The ref gave a stern warning to both men. Ruddock went to touch gloves, Tyson refused, and the action resumed. The 11th was all in all a close round, both men throwing caution to the wind. They were both landing hard blows but also leaving themselves open to taking return fire. This fight had at times been a strategy-driven game of chess, and at other times a complete free-for-all brawl. The 12th would be no different. And this was because Tyson's numerous point deductions, mixed with some dominant moments for Ruddock, put into question exactly who the judges thought was ahead. After all, at times it's difficult to predict a judge's scorecard even when the fight was a complete blowout. For both men, it was better safe than sorry. A knockout would ensure victory, but each man only had three minutes to achieve one. Tyson began by reverting back to his classic footwork, shifting with lateral movement to land a lead hook that partially connected. Ruddock's check hooks and uppercuts remained an asset and a liability. Tyson was countering with full combinations now, and they were working. If the counter didn't land, the second or third follow-up shot had a good chance to. But Ruddock was finding the mark as well, and Tyson was running out of time. At a minute 20 left, Tyson's hook got through Ruddock's guard to connect with his temple. However, Ruddock remained standing. With a minute 10 left, Ruddock slipped Tyson's jab to land a beautiful counter cross. At half a minute left, Ruddock hurled a smash into Tyson's midsection. Five seconds left, Ruddock landed a hard leading cross over Tyson's jab. Tyson responded with a low hook, and Ruddock returned the favor and followed up with an uppercut. The bell rang, and Tyson hurled one last overhand. The two smiled and embraced. It was a punishing fight for both men, and now it was in the judges' hands. And as all three judges saw it, Tyson had won the fight, even with the numerous point deductions. He would now go on to face Evander Holyfield to see who would become champion of the world. Thanks for watching. From the Modern Martial Artist, this has been David Christian, wishing you happy training.